When he had perceived the people were about to come and take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lord is very effective in the Gospels of using agrarian images in his parables, in his stories, so that the people who had real access and familiarity with things of nature could understand better the truth that he was trying to convey. And we remember these as very famous parables. We know the parable of the mustard seed. We know the parable of the sower and the seed, the parable of the fig tree, the, the vines and the branches. We know all of those. And they work because even though we are separated from our Lord's original words by 2,000 years, we still have gardens and we still know where our food comes from and we have real familiar familiarity and access ourselves to that process. And I think we can still take those images and still use them to engage with Holy Scripture in a better way. So for instance, right now you may be enjoying your summer harvest either from your garden or from someone else's garden, which is the case for me, maybe from the farmer's market, or if you would like to bring me tomatoes, for instance, you're more than welcome to do so. I love people bringing big bags of these wonderful, delicious summer um, um, gifts. And when you open up a bag, for instance, of tomatoes, you have to take them all out and put them on the counter. Because once you do that, you need to immediately discern what order they need to be eaten in. Some of them aren't quite ready, and so you put them on the window seal. Let the sun ripen them for another day or two until they're ready to eat. Some are in between, and some are about to split wide open. And so you grab your plate and you grab your knife and your bread and your mayonnaise and you eat it immediately because it's ready. That fruit is ready now. So in the same way, when you're looking at Holy Scripture, or especially the texts for a Sunday morning, it's all fruit. It's all good spiritual fruit for us. Some of it, it may take some time for us to digest. Maybe it has to sit on the window seal with us so that we both can grow a bit and ripen before we understand it. Sometimes there is a word or a phrase that is ripe for us now to ingest. That fruit is just for us. And so my recommendation is that when you're reading Scripture, and again, today's Scriptures, when you're looking at the bulletin, understand the whole point and purpose of the reading in its entirety, but then pay attention. Pay attention to whatever word or phrase or image that lingers in your mind even when the reading continues. Stay with that, because that may be the fruit that you need today. So in today's gospel, we, we begin John chapter 6, which we will be in for some weeks. John chapter 6, on the whole, as we look at all of the spiritual fruit, is what biblical scholars often call the bread of life discourse. And it's called the bread of life discourse because, as we will soon discover, Jesus is talking about his body as flesh for us to eat, the bread of life, his blood, spiritual drink for us to drink. It's where he tells his disciples, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no life in you. A very controversial saying that when he does, he loses a significant portion of his disciples. Today, the chapter begins with the feeding of the 5,000, the multiplication of the bread and the fishes, the one miracle that all four evangelists include in their Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have this miracle in common. And it is a, a Eucharistic miracle, a foreshadowing of the power of the Holy Eucharist. And we know that for several reasons. One is that we're told, John tells us, this happened on the Passover. Christ is our Passover lamb. Christ, our Passover sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, we sometimes say in our liturgies. And it's this wonderful miracle of people gathering together, 5,000 at least, and Jesus taking accessible and meager, simple elements, and by his word, enabling them to now become something greater and feeding the 5,000, and not only feeding them, but giving them their complete fill, not only giving them their fill, but now there were 12 baskets left over. Now, sometimes people will try to suggest that this is not a Eucharistic miracle or a foreshadowing of the Eucharist, but this is rather some great celebration of the generosity of a community. 
where people gather together and they see collectively there is a need. So maybe they all start undoing their knapsacks and looking inside and thinking, well, I have one piece of bread. I have one bit of fish. Maybe I can share. And together, when we pull together, we can take care of one another. It works rhetorically, and it's a good, it's a good idea to motivate the community, but that's not what the text says. The text is a miracle of Jesus Christ taking five loaves and two fish brought by a young lad and by his word making them become something more. In the same way, when we come together and we partake of the meager and simple and accessible elements of wheat and wine, they become something greater. They become the body and blood of our Lord in which we not only have our spiritual fill, but as the psalmist says, our cup runneth over. That is part of the great power of this miracle. And that is what begins the sixth chapter of St. John. That's the whole. That's the spiritual fruit all on the counter. But when I read this, I linger on verse 15. And I linger a little bit more on verse 21. Verse 15 is what happens when all these people, they see this profound miracle that our Lord does. And they recognize, understandably, rightly, that he is something different, that he may be the one that they have been waiting for. And so what is their response at the prophet in their midst? They want to take him by force and make him their king. And Jesus withdraws. From there, he goes to his disciples who now are on the boat on the uh, Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. Not a sea in the ocean, but a large lake. The waves are crashing in, the storms are coming. Jesus walks on water and tells his disciples, it is I, do not be afraid. They see him, they're overwhelmed with joy, and they want to take him in their boat. And when they want to do that, John tells us that mystically the boat is whisked away immediately to the other side, to the other shore, and they hit land. So for me, my question is, why did Jesus withdraw? What does it mean when they wanted to take him by force and make him king? Why is that in the gospel? And what does that mean for you and what does it mean for me? Let me get right to the point. I think one of the powerful truths in this gospel is the reminder that those who have the power to take someone by force and make someone king arguably have more power and authority than the one who wears the crown. The one who can make a king is more powerful than the king. And that's the first warning against that temptation. Because I think that the devil's favorite tactic, it's very subtle, is to tempt people to take that which is good, beautiful, true, to take that which is noble, that which is holy, and then use it for their own personal gain, to exploit it for their own profit, their own prestige, their own power. I think we can come up pretty easily with examples that we see both in society, history, and our own lives. How many people, how many public servants, for instance, entered public life for all the right reasons, all the noble reasons, all the good and selfless reasons to serve their communities, to serve their state, to serve their nation? And then maybe before they even realized it, they were now as crooked as a question mark, using the people's trust for their own profit, their own gain, their own power. How many preachers started out sweating for the gospel, preaching in clapboard little churches all across as an evangelist going and desiring people to know the love and mercy of Jesus Christ, to know a transformed life, and they gave themselves to that calling. And then over time, the temptation came in, and now 
Their concern is more about what may be in the plate coming up than what's in the prayers of his people. How many examples can we come up with with those who began to respond to the call to what is good, beautiful, true, noble, and holy have now given in to the temptation to take that and to twist it and to control it, to gain from it, to find power in it. I think Jesus withdrew from the people because they don't have the authority to make him king. He is king, not by any vote, not by any fiat of the people, but by his very nature. And by trying to make him king, they were trying, maybe not without, without realizing it, to control him, and if they can control him, they can gain from it. Now, I think this is true. I think that most all people desire the right things. Aristotle even once said a long, long time ago that every act is actually aimed for one's good. We all desire, I think, that which is good, beautiful, and true. The difference is how we desire it, and that makes all the difference in the world. We all desire companionship. We all desire love and intimacy. How we desire it is where the difference lies. We all desire to make a difference, to have a fulfilled purpose, to be relevant. How we do that is all the difference. And so I think one of the messages we have in this gospel, one of the fruits that are just hanging off the vine, is that warning to us that we can't take Jesus and make him what we want him to be. We can't take Jesus and make him our mouthpiece. We can't take Jesus and anoint him the monarch of our private, personal, provincial dominion in our lives. And when we see that, we see that all the time. And Jesus himself says, not to terrify us, but to warn us that not everyone who just says, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of heaven. We can't just make him what we want him to be and then expect his power and grace to flow abundantly into our lives. We respond to him. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we keep ourselves from falling into that temptation? I think one of the primary ways is to make sure that our faith, which is personal and must be personal, does not also become private. That our faith is not something that we keep only within ourselves, where we have our own little kingdom with our own monarch and our own dominion. And a way to think about that is, is to ask ourselves, do people in my life, my coworkers, my family, my friends, are they aware of simple things like my dietary restrictions or preferences, but don't know about my faith? Does everyone know where I spent four years of college, but do not know where I've spent decades of Sundays? Am I living out my faith with authenticity? Am I upset in proclaiming the blasphemy of the Olympics and the Last Supper scene, but then skipping Holy Communion to watch those very same Olympics on television? These are kind of the questions that we ask ourselves to keep ourselves from becoming just like those who wanted to bring Jesus into his boat and their boat alone. But the main thing, I think, to do all of that is doing exactly what you're doing now. And that is recognizing that we need to be a part of something bigger, that my faith is personal, and it's transformed me, but I find the power of that transformation in this community. I find the power of meager elements of wheat and wine in the community. Together, we come together to hear the word of God, to feel the movement of the Holy Spirit, and to receive the grace of our Lord in the sacraments and in this body. And that is why, friends, in this parish, we try very hard to keep our focus on that which unites us all across the world, the universal church, the holy Catholic and apostolic church, so we too as a parish don't become provincial and insular in our own private dominion. Because that temptation goes to churches, to clergy, and to individuals. But here's the good news. The people didn't have to take Jesus Christ and make him their king. He already is their king. The disciples didn't have to bring Jesus into their boat because they were afraid someone else might get them. He's everyone's. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Not because I have grabbed him, but because he's given himself to me. He's given himself freely to all of us. 
And that's the good news of great hope and great joy for all people that we renew every time we come together and every time we say our amen, that he is our Lord and he is our King, not by our doing, not by our vote, but because the Father has sent him. So our task as Christians is to live into that that recognition, that awareness, that clarity of vision that the King is in our midst. And praise be to Jesus, because he is the Lord of all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.